What I want to do is uh, give you an overview of the earthquake early warning effort called Shake Alert uh, and what our current status is and maybe near the end a little bit about how you can help us out. Um, like many large projects, this is a collaborative effort among many, many different groups. You can see them listed there. The lead organizations, um, the state, USGS, and the uh, university partners, as well as very generous uh, financial and, uh, and moral support from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, uh, a nonprofit. Uh, but there are many, many more players than this, and a lot of them are in the room. Uh, I'll begin with the obvious. A, a, a description of what early warning is all about. I, I think you all understand it pretty well. It's not earthquake prediction. It is detecting and characterizing an earthquake so rapidly that you can tell that it's big, you can estimate the area that it is going to shake, and then you can send alerts uh, to those areas before the strong shaking actually arrives. And to highlight this, we're going to walk through the scenario earthquake, the famous shake alert, or I'm sorry, the not shake alert, but the uh, famous shake out scenario on the southern San Andreas Fault. So you see here um, the same uh, supercomputer generated graphic uh, that Tom Jordan showed earlier uh, for the shake out event. Uh, the earthquake's epicenter is at the Red Star, Bombay Beach, uh, Salton Sea, and it will rupture 180 miles to the northwest of the San Andreas Fault. Uh, the black triangles here are seismic stations uh, in this sort of simulation that I'll walk through. Notice the counter in the lower left, the green 000, that is our, our time counter. So at time zero, the earthquake begins, and the shaking energy starts to propagate outward from the epicentral area, as you see in the, in the orange and red in this graphic. So about five seconds later, it hits a sufficient number of seismic stations, and they're able to analyze the ground motion that's beginning. The algorithms that we use are uh, analyzing different windows of time, but as short as seven-tenths of a second, in order to determine, based on that little bit of snippet of P wave, that this is a big earthquake rather than a small earthquake. So given that uh, about five seconds time for the energy to propagate, hit the stations, do some calculations, and send the warnings out, approximately five seconds, we are going to send the warning out to surrounding communities that an earthquake is underway. Now, we're going to continue to walk through this a little step at a time. Notice the counter has now incremented to 10 seconds, so we're five seconds after the alert has been sent. And we'll move here. Now Palm Springs is shaking. 25 seconds after the earthquake began, 20 seconds after the alert began. So you can uh, see that in, in even a close community like Palm Springs, they might get as much as 20 seconds in this particular scenario. Moving forward, San Bernardino is now shaking hard at 50 seconds, having gotten about 45 seconds of warning. Orange County is now shaking a little bit after a minute, so they've gotten about a minute's warning. And now the Los Angeles Basin is shaking like a bowl of jello, uh, and they would have gotten well over a minute's warning in this particular scenario. Of course, I show this in part because it shows that the farther away you are from the earthquake, the more warning you get. It's a very common question. How much warning will I get? And the answer is, where are you relative to the earthquake? We've been working on this process for quite a while. The USGS has published a, uh, an implementation plan, a technical implementation plan describing what's needed to build the system out. Uh, the state of California is also working on its own implementation plan. The, uh, the implementation plan goal says that we intend to send warning parameters to government and private sector users as soon as the shake alert system meets quality and reliability standards in any particular region. The scope of this system is the West Coast, the three states of the West Coast, Washington, Oregon, California. And so we did an estimate of what it would take to build out this system. These are the dollars that you see across the bottom. To build the system for the West Coast, about $28 million. To run it, about $16 million a year. Because we were afraid that if we made the $38 million ask to the elected officials, we would get it, and no operational funds, our consistent ask to elected officials has been for the 16 million. And so far, we have ramped up to about 8 million. 
So we're about halfway there in terms of stable federal funding for the system. But of course, we didn't get the build it uh, dollars. Uh, there is a bill before the state uh, to potentially fund it for the state of California build out. Uh, but in the meantime, we're doing what we can to build the system out with the available funds. And we're making progress in that regard, which I'll show you in a bit. So this is the path to Shake Alert. The R&D phase, which was three years long, began in 2006. Uh, at the end of that phase, uh, Bill Leith, the head of, now the head of the earthquake program, uh, basically threw down the gauntlet and gave us a challenge and said, OK, show me that this works. You've done it in the laboratory. Show me it works in the real world. So we spent the next three years from about 2009 to 2012 in the operationalization phase of wiring it into the live seismic networks. Uh, this system is built on the existing capabilities for monitoring earthquakes in the seismic networks of the West Coast that are part of the Advanced National Seismic System. That resulted in a California demonstration system that began sending live alerts to beta users in January of 2012. The next phase was to move from that sort of duct tape and bailing wire proof of concept to demonstration system to one that it was more stable. And in February of this year, we rolled out the production prototype, which is a redundant, regionally diverse, and well-managed and well-tested version of the processing system. Uh, we intend to propagate that to the Pacific Northwest in the summer of this year. So that's the phase we're in now. We're continuing to improve the system. The production prototype is live. We'll move it to the Pacific Northwest. And we're now beginning to uh, allow pilot projects. During the demonstration phase, the, demon, the beta users were given access to the feeds but told, don't do anything with it. Watch it go by, figure out what you're going to do, start to get ready, but don't do anything. And now we're shifting gears and we're saying, give us a proposal for pilot projects where you'll actually do something real. Uh, the idea is to get uh, the nose under the tent and start to get folks used to the idea of early warning and how it can be implemented and start to build capabilities out in the public and private sector. The USGS budget, if you'll read somewhere through those 300 pages justifying the entire USGS budget, there is a statement that says we intend to do limited public rollout by 2018. Of course, the question is what is limited? Uh, so we'll see how we go given that we don't have full funding. A couple of examples of success stories for the large earthquakes that have occurred. Uh, these are actually during the time of the demonstration system. The La Habra earthquake, a magnitude 5 in the LA area, uh, it began sending alerts uh, four seconds after origin time of the earthquake. That's the way I prefer to measure the speed of the system. So from the time the earthquake began to the time the first alert went out from the system, four seconds. In the case of Napa, where the seismic hardware on the ground is a little bit older and a little bit slower, uh, it took about five seconds to send that alert out. There are five major components to the system. I'm going to show you the progress of each of these. The um, seismic sensor network is a huge part of the infrastructure upgrade that we have to do. Um, it accounts for a lot of the expense of building out the system. Uh, we've got about 650 stations currently putting data into the system. Most of those are in California. Uh, and our plan calls for about 1,600 total. We've concentrated on the metropolitan areas. And therefore, if you look at the, the two maps on the left, you'll see that we have pretty good coverage in both the Bay and the Los Angeles area. Those white circles around the red seismic stations are 10 kilometer circles, which is our target radius. Uh, so you can see the LA area, uh, the greater LA area, is, uh, is fairly well covered now, as is the Bay Area. So those would be the areas where we would entertain the pilots and probably begin limited public rollout as soon as we're ready. We're also including GPS, or these days called GNSS stations. So it's more than just seismic. And that's because we've learned the lesson of the Tohoku earthquake. In the lower right-hand side, uh, there's a graph of the performance of the Japanese Meteorological Agency early warning system for that magnitude 9 Tohoku earthquake. So if you look at the red line there, you see the first warning was issued with an estimate a little bit over magnitude 7. And as the event progressed and evolved and actually turned into, ultimately, a magnitude 9, their system 
topped out at about magnitude 8.1. And we found that without the use of other ground displacement information from geodetic sources, you're not going to get the right answer. And so it's important to have the geodesy contribute to the performance of the early warning system. So we've begun uh, just last week. We had a big meeting of all the folks who run uh, geodesy networks in uh, California and the Pacific Northwest. And we're basically herding the cats to get the data flowing into the system in the same format so that it's accessible to the system. And right now we've got about 130 stations, I think, flowing into the system at real time. Another thing we're taking a look at is lower cost sensors and crowdsourcing. And I'll just show one example of this. The, um, the Chile uh, project involves putting a cell phone in a box along with a purpose-built uh, GPS sensor externally, which is of higher precision than the one that's available in the phone, putting this all together in a weatherproof box and bolting it to the roof of a building in Chile. Um, this takes care of some of the other issues that are related to using cell phones for measuring geophysical phenomena, like the fact that they're usually moving around in people's pockets, uh, that people don't like to run the software because it kills their battery. Uh, so by doing these sort of purpose-built systems, it's getting us some information about how uh, these lower cost sensors can contribute to the early warning system. And we believe that ultimately they will do a good job of augmenting the better quality scientific grade networks that we're building right now. Another component of the system is field telemetry. All these seismic sensors in the field, you got to get the data back into the central processing system, so we're working on this as well. Um, we use every available means because we don't want the failure of any one system to take the system down. So we do that. Uh, we don't put all of our eggs in one basket. We instead have multiple baskets from different carriers and different technologies. One of the things we have is our own uh, USGS own microwave backbone. As you can see it going up the state. The red dots are ones that are being built in the next year or two, uh, and the equipment for this has already been purchased. Now, this uh, wiring diagram is a schematic of the internals of the system. The system actually uses multiple algorithms that all detect the earthquakes in slightly different ways, send that information to what's known as a decision module, which puts it all together into a single answer, and then generates alerts and sends them to the public. So data is flowing from the bottom of this graphic towards the top. The little clusters of colored blobs with the eggs in them, uh, those are the regionally distinct instances of the system. So we've got redundant systems running in Pasadena, Menlo Park, Berkeley, and the Seattle system, uh, the production system, was just installed uh, last week. So the idea is that any one of these systems can fail and the entire system continues to move on. There's redundancy built into the system. If you look at the algorithm development, we're continuing to look at better algorithms to do this task. Over on the far left-hand side, the purple boxes are the algorithms that are currently in the system. Uh, there are three, and I won't describe them in any detail. Um, but there's a fourth one, uh, Finder, the green box, which is currently in testing. And it's important because it is the algorithm that does not assume a point source, but rather is able to calculate the length of fault that has ruptured in real time. So it's basically doing real-time modeling of the earthquake source. Over in the third generation, the orange things are the geodesy components using the geodetic signals that I talked about earlier to get even better answers for the size, location, and extent of the faulting as the earthquake develops. And then finally, that fourth generation red box is a combination of seismic and geodetic or a seismogeodetic algorithm. So we're continuing to develop algorithms, test them, and if they're good enough, and if they prove their worth, they will be incorporated into the production system. Now, one thing you have to keep in mind is that when earthquakes get big, they're being uh, created by faults that are growing. And so a lot of folks think of the alert as being a simple on-off switch. Just tell me, is there an earthquake? Should I drop cover and hold on or not? Um, and from your point of view as an individual at a particular location, that works. But from the point of view of the system, it's a little more complicated than that. A few seconds after the earthquake, you can define a region that is likely to shake at a particular level. But as the earthquake grows, that region also grows. 
So this graphic is intended to show through a, for a sort of a cartoon fashion that these red growing circles uh, represent the area to be alerted, which is going to grow over time as the earthquake grows. And we found that a lot of the uh, emergency management systems, and particularly those systems that issue alerts, don't know how to cope with this. And so that's a challenge for the system. Getting to the idea of getting the notice out to folks, most of us assume, well, I've got a smartphone, I get text messages, I get push notifications, I get all sorts of information on my phone, therefore, that's where I'll get my earthquake early warning alert from. It can't be done right now. The technology will not support it. Let me explain why. Your text messages are a one-to-many sort of, uh, or actually a many-to-many -many thing. When we detect an earthquake and we need to notify millions of people in a metropolitan area, we cannot send millions of text messages. The system cannot handle that. The telcos do not have the capacity to do that, and therefore it will either crash the system or delay messages by minutes. It's not practical. Well, I've got apps, I've got Twitter, I've got uh, things that push ads at me all the time. What about these push notification? Same problem. The pipe between the telcos and you is only so big, and you can only push so much data through it. And so these systems simply cannot support mass notification at the level and speeds that we need it for earthquake early warning. Is there hope? Yes. Cell broadcast. The way cell broadcast works is you define the area to be alerted, and the telcos figure out which of their cell towers are in that area, and then they send a broadcast from each tower. So rather than sending an individual notification to, to people, they broadcast from those towers, your phone picks it up, and you are notified. That's the good news. The technology exists. This is actually called WIA, Wireless Emergency Alert. Uh, the, there are some issues with it, however. Um, let me show you this wiring diagram from FEMA. They operate the iPaws system. The uh, iPaws is Integrated Public Alert and Warning System. You're probably familiar with it through imminent threat alerts and uh, AMBER alerts, but um, it's too slow. That's the bottom line. It was not designed for the speeds needed for earthquake early warning. There's some hope that that will be uh, remedied. There's an FCC uh, rules change that's currently open, suggesting that the entire WIA system be sped up so that alerts take no more than three seconds. So it's an opportunity for you to respond and uh, ideally uh, support the idea of changing the infrastructure so that it can alert in a much faster way. The industry itself, ADIS, a uh, trade group, is also interested in doing this in a more voluntary fashion among the cell carriers. Um, I'm going to skip over that since I'm running out of time. The last component in our diagram is the communications education and training component, and there's going to be significant activity in order to train the public and end users about the system. Obviously, it doesn't do any good to issue alerts if nobody knows what to do with them. And finally, here's our rollout plan. I've already sort of suggested this. We'll do pilots. Uh, initially, that's the phase we're in now, uh, and then basically just expand the use, wider automated use, uh, then finally to some limited people who have been trained, ultimately to some groups of folks who have not been trained, say in closed venues like a shopping mall or a theater, um, then geographic public uh, release, and then finally full public release. So, final slide, the applications, of course, are pretty clear, I think. Uh, we can send notifications to people who can get out of harm's way. We can send notifications to things that can take mitigative actions that will protect people and property. Slowing and stopping trains, BART is already using the system. Um, LA Metro is uh, engaged in a pilot program with us. Uh, so there are lots of automatic systems that would not require training in order to protect lives and property. And then, of course, it will improve situational awareness in a much faster way, possibly even getting information out um, before critical systems go down. So in the spirit of the questions of this conference, what can you do? Where do you fit into this? Besides the obvious things like being supportive of the system and, of course, demanding from your legislators that they give us lots of money to complete it, um, 
There are other things that, uh, that can be done. Um, so for example, uh, I talked about the work that needs to be done in the private sector to develop products uh, to enable the process so that public-private partnership is being, gonna be very important. So when you're talking to stakeholders, to remember that early warning is in our portfolio of things that we can do to reduce earthquake losses. And then you can also uh, respond to the FCC announcement, for example, in support of speeding up those systems for the sake of earthquake alerts. Uh, and of course, the, the, uh, the other thing is you can be aware yourself that this is an important project, that uh, when you're talking to folks, make sure that that is part of the discussion uh, and things that are coming down the line to help uh, you with your job of reducing the impacts of earthquakes in the communities you live in. So that's it, and thank you. All right, well, good morning. It's almost afternoon, close to lunch, um, so we're getting there. Um, again, I'm Tina Curry. I'm with the State of California, Governor's Office of Emergency Services, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk a little bit more, to expand on what Doug covered very well about what earthquake early warning is and what it means to us and all the many benefits, but really how we're tackle tackling this strategically, um, but at the State of California, knowing that, of course, it will be replicated um, elsewhere. Um, just this effort is so significant in many ways, it probably goes without saying. First and foremost, we we live with great earthquake risk. We're reminded that of that by being right here in, in Long Beach and also of all the recent devastating events that happened around the world. This is just a reality for, for really everybody. It's also a huge development in, in um, improvement of public safety and how we can might be able to avoid losses. Um, it's really, really, these few seconds are such a big deal and changes the, really the condition that we've, we've lived with all this time. And finally, as Doug said, it's going to be built out here in the West Coast first. Uh, so we have a big responsibility to get that right because it will be, re be replicated elsewhere from what we start here. So again, I'm gonna cover, a, you know, to, to complement Doug's presentation, hopefully what we're doing strategically, some of the policy considerations that come with this, with this effort, um, some of the sustainability considerations and how we should organize to make this a full reality in California and elsewhere. Oh, clicker works, great. Um, so start with a little bit about the role of emergency management. Maybe this, everybody knows this, maybe it's new, but just why, why are we involved? Um, in, in, uh, throughout states and municipalities and really everywhere, there's some function of emergency management in some form or fashion. We happen to sit in the governor's office in the state of California, and you know, that's sort of organized differently in, in, um, in different municipalities and in different levels, but it more or less prov provides the same function. It's, it's directing the actions of other agencies. We don't have a lot of bandwidth or expertise to do everything that's needed to respond to an emergency, but we call on others that do and bring it all together so that we can respond. But responding means preparing and getting ready and mitigating and recovering for emergencies too. So it's really all functions. And it has to be in a single system that can operate seamlessly when the time comes. So really, emergency management's a, a, a big convening operation, so we already have relationships with public safety, with other partners, with other agencies, so we want to leverage that for early warning because we, we need to use what we've got, and, um, you know, really, and, and we have an audience that's really captive and, and committed to anything we can do to improve, improve public safety and improve our ability to respond. Um, so for this reason, it plays an important role in earthquake early warning. So one of my suggestions is, 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 as this is being contemplated elsewhere, is to make sure to involve emergency management. We will certainly do that at all levels in California. Emergency management has also been um, traditionally involved in warning systems. These are just a couple of the ones that, that we have here in California, whether it's our tsunami warning program, our weather alerts, um, nuclear power plants, and um, that's important because those are long-standing systems. They have organization structures that have federal government, private sector, municipalities, state involvement, and they work really well together. So from a programmatic uh, approach, that's really important to look to these, see what works, and know that we can do that also for earthquake early warning. Um, 
It's about where the similarities end, though, with early warning. As Doug covered, this is so different. This, has, this is actions that will be enabled in seconds, not in days, not in hours, not even in minutes. Um, so with that, it is a different kind of thing than, than your garden variety warning system. So we realize that, and that comes with a lot of complex and important considerations. So some of those things that are, that are complicated, and again, Doug mentioned some of these. We have authorities to deliver warnings. That's good. Um, we don't have to create that. We have um, you know, some, uh, some sensor coverage already in California. We're going to build this on the backbone that already exists. But as Doug mentioned, that's got to be augmented. It's got to grow exponentially in order to support this. For the most part, we're using existing staff to, to develop this so far, which is great. There's so much institutional knowledge. This has been worked on for years, but it's a relatively small group. We have to prepare ourselves now to be able to launch all the concentric actions that need to happen to build out the program, whether it's the technology, the education program, the engagement with all the stakeholders, and the connectivity to the automated action. So we're kind of planning in a, in a, in a small um, team, so to speak, but also understanding that we're really going to have to expand and preparing ourselves for that. That's, that's definitely complete. Complexity. I'll, I'll go into public education training and outreach a little bit more in just a second, but that part of it is huge. We have great education programs now for earthquake. We will leverage those, but there are a lot of differences with earthquake early warning and educating the public, readying the public to receive this that come with that. Oops, I didn't mean to switch quite yet. Funding. That's been a subject of a lot of discussion. And um, you know there, there, there has to be a way that this is distributed and that the benefits are understood and that it's sustained. So there's a buildup cost and then there's the cost to keep it going. And that's not even to, to look at what improvements will be needed down the line, what new technology will be employed. So we've really got to set up a foundation for that so that it's supported, it's understood, um, you know, and as the dollars are calculated, we have a methodical and sensible way to fund it. We can't avoid inevitable fluctuations of budget. It happens to all of us. The economy um, you know, has its, its, uh, its hills and valleys, so we've got to set, up, set this up to last. We have to protect the system once it comes into play. A set of standards are needed, um, not just for the technology so that we know that it's reliable, so we know that it's dependable, but also for information security. Cybersecurity is one of our biggest risks. We have to look at that to make sure that this is safe and that this information, when it needs to be delivered, it can be and is not going to be at risk to, to those types of threats. And finally, the content of the warning messages. When you think about it, how important it is are the words we use and the message that gets delivered. That has to be standardized. It has to be delivered in a way that's understandable and, um, and can be taken up when the time comes and, and when seconds count. And last, certainly not least, is the implementation. So much has already happened. It's being built now. It's being tested. We're, there's no time being wasted to make sure that this, this works and that this can be available. But there's all the other implementation components, too working with stakeholders, getting an education program launched and embedded within the fabric. And all of it has to be timed in a way so that when this is you know, really out there to the public and being received, that everything has lined up around it. So implementation itself is very complex. Just to go down the path of just one of these com complex issues, just for a second, is our nation's critical, critical infrastructure. This is a list of 16. It's, 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 it's um, widely known, um, came about, um, organized in this fashion after 9-11, when really as a nation we were looking at those areas that are so critical to our economy, to our public safety, so to everything that we count on in our daily life, that any disruption will cause harm to, um, to those things that we count on. So, you know, we have this approach, we have this audience that's already attending to what the security needs and how we protect these sectors. This is, if you take earthquake early warning and apply it to this, you really see that it touches just about all of these areas in some way or potentially could. So how do we leverage that existing, um, that grouping and that structure in order to embed earthquake early warning to improve that security condition, to improve that safety condition for all of these various industries? Just, just communications alone, as was touched on earlier, and how this, um, you know, can, can needs the speed with which this needs to move through and how our communications sector is, is prepared to not only deliver that, 
But how do we protect it so that it can deliver it when the time comes? Because, you know, earthquakes and any other emergency um, will inevitably disrupt those very things we're counting on to make sure that we're safe. So all that has to be considered as we move forward. Education, another area already been touched on again, so I'll be brief. But this audience is very broad. It's the public. It's first responders. What does this mean to them, to our police and our fire? If they get a little, what is their responsibility going to be to act on these warnings? Um, users, both for automated actions and things that may happen that are, that are human driven. Um, all of those things are, are different education components. The content is not one size fits all. That earthquake is going to change as a, as a signal means moves, you know, moves through and the farther you are away, then, then uh, there's more time. But all of that has to be kind of calculated and distributed in a, in, a, in a matter of seconds. So how is the education component that goes with this so the public knows? If I'm standing over here, the message may say this, but if I'm here, it might be something else. Um, we also have to message effectively and in unison about what we are doing. Um, it's really important that um, you know, it's great that um, the media has been a fantastic partner, has highlighted this initiative over and over again, and that's really the foundation for support and for public understanding. But we have to keep doing that. We have to keep talking about, about that with the public. Why is it being built here um, first and, and, and in other places second? And what, what does this order that we've come up with really mean in terms of how it will be rolled out? Um, education has to be constant. Fortunately, thankfully, large earthquakes don't happen very often. But what that means is a lot of time goes by before, and they, and they slip out of people's memory. So somehow we have to find a way to keep the education constant so that people know what to do and what this means when this uh, you know, very rare occasion occurs and earthquake early warning hopefully will be deployed. And that's where it's important that there's some consistency across the nation and across the states because we all move about, um, we travel, um, you know, we, we have to be able to sort of receive this the same way no matter so, that, so that's an area where while each state will construct this um, you know, to meet their needs, there's some things that really are important to be common. So our education group that's really been um, thinking hard about all these important considerations is, is looking at that as well. So that was a list of a lot of really hard things about earthquake early warning, so I don't mean to be um, that it's so daunting that we, we can't do it, because there is a lot being done. There is a lot that we can leverage, and we will succeed at pulling this all together. Um, there's this, but it is a big project. It demands a very organized approach, and it demands a lot of concurrent actions happening, and we have to be ready to, um, to deliver that. Again, we have the technology, we've talked about that. We have a history of warning systems, we talked about that. All those things we can use and take the best of all of that and, and um, move forward to uh, make early warning a reality. There is, um, when, when working with um, leadership and policymakers, and I think this is important because this is what we're all here for, for the, for the, for the you know, next few days is to talk about, you know, what is our strategy? What are, what are those important considerations? But it's important to tie this to overall earthquake safety and, um, and your infrastructure programs and everything that we talk about with earthquakes. So this is a component of it. This fits in. This makes a difference um, in our overall strategy to make ourselves more resilient um, to this earthquake threat. So that's really important. It's gonna be important for support. It's gonna be important for sustainment in the long run that it's viewed as a component of, of something bigger. Um, at the tactical level, um, we need to talk again to, to with first responders and with the public safety community. What does this mean to them um, to have this few seconds? What, you know, what are they going to be able to do to take those protective actions? To, um, one, just one of the automated actions that was mentioned was being able to ensure that first responders can respond. Um, one of the things that, that is a known benefit of this is making sure that the fire doors are open if um, we have a few seconds to do that. So before they get damaged, um, that will enable that, that response to take place when it needs to. So just an example, but many, many other tangents to, um, to for just the first responder component alone. 
public-private partnerships, we've talked about that already. Um, whether it's critical infrastructure providers, most of that is provided by the, by the private sector. To all the things that are yet to be um, opportunities or, or support mechanism that the private sector will contribute to this. There are um, technologies, there's things we haven't even envisioned yet that will be products of this earthquake early warning initiative. And it's very important that we engage the private sector so that we can set up that path of joint leadership and, and development over time so that it can only get better and be as strong as it can be. Clear leadership and, and unity of, of effort or governance is very important. Um, it's very important as we're working with stakeholders, which is everybody um, in this, in this um, arena, but also so that we, we understand who's doing what, what are the roles and responsibilities, and everything else that lines up behind that, including funding and um, all the other components of this program. Consistent and continuous messaging about this work and why it's important. Again, the media has been a great partner in that, and we have to keep up that, that rhythm of, of information out to the public and talk about what we're doing. The first step is a plan, of course. USGS's technical implementation plan is the basis by which we're, we're planning in California to build out all these other components and how we're going to build them out together. And we have to think about earthquake early warning now and then earthquake early warning in the future. So building something that will withstand the changes that inevitably happen, um, both to our budgets and to everything else just in life, and that understanding that technology is going to improve over time. So yes, this is what it is today, and it's a few seconds, which is, which is momentous, but who knows what tomorrow brings? So we have to prepare ourselves to envision that, um, that those changes over time and how it will continuously improve um, and how we're setting ourselves up to, to, to make it better and to always be improving. So just to simplify sort of how we've organized these, these different components that I've, I've discussed about and, 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 um, and how will we, we will be um, uh, organizing our work going forward is, of course, having a understood governance structure. Who's doing what? What are the roles and responsibilities? How is it prepared to expand, to deliver, and uh, fully implement earthquake early warning? But also the financing mechanism, the financing strategy to ensure that the costs are understood and distributed in proportion to what the benefits are and that we sustain that over time. Uh, research and development, a lot of things could be um, characterized as that, whether it's standards, uh, continuous improvement, and just how we will, we will um, grow from, from here, from where we are today into a, the system of tomorrow. Operations is the nuts and bolts of actually building this and getting it done and delivering the, um, the uh, service. And finally, education and outreach to the public, continuous as we build and going forward. Every one of these has a lot of, a lot of details behind it, so we're trying to think about that now, anticipate what that will take and so that we can understand what our charge is going to be going forward. Uh, the implementation for framework for California, as Doug mentioned, is folds, folds together the USGS technical implementation plan, the California considerations, so that it's one set of goals that we will work through together. Um, alongside of this, we will have a governance structure. Um, we actually have legislative directives in California, a few of, of which um, uh, I'll mention. One is directing Cal OES, our office, to implement the system in California. We also have uh, legislation that was passed that creates an earthquake safety fund. Um, that will be the repository, if you will, of, of funding that the state um, contributes towards this endeavor, and also calls for the creation of a governance structure. You know, so those things are, the table is set, so to speak, so that we can build out all the things that we need to. So hopefully that paints a picture of the, our understanding of, of what the challenges are, our approach to how we're going to be tackling those, and um, you know, all with the, the mindset that this will be built and we will succeed, and we've you know, got a lot of considerations with that, a lot of players involved, but we've got a great history and tradition of how to do that well that I know will carry out through early warning. So again, we, we all live with earthquake risk. That's why we're all here spending these few days to talk about what we're doing, how we can do better. Um, and um, up until now, you know, this, this particular, um, how this particular development um, really makes a difference is we've accepted that earthquakes happen without any notice. We've planned around that, we've oriented ourselves around that, and we are prepared 
to deal with that. But this really changes that condition in a very significant way. So even just a few seconds makes, makes a huge difference. And we understand the importance of that and what that responsibility brings with it. But if I can ask a favor of you, if, we're, if we can um, kind of tie this up with, with um, what you all can do, is as you go through the next few days, think about early warning in your discussions. Think about what if we had 30 seconds, um, whether we're talking about you know, building codes or technology or whatever, and, um, and how can you help us um, really, really um, do this right and take all those strategic considerations and, and fold them into this one, I think we'll, we'll, we'll only make this as, as good as it can be. I guess that's my, my hook to wrap up. So thank you to NEC for including this in the topics of, of discussion. And thank you to all our partners who've been working on this for so many years um, to make this not a possibility, but a reality. So we, we appreciate um, the opportunity to be part of it. Thank you.